We're going deeper on the lawsuit that could change the NFL with Andrew Brandt. Plus, NBA free agency has begun, the Euros are drawing big viewership numbers in the U.S., and a former number one NFL pick is being sued by his alma mater. It's Monday, July 1st. Welcome to the second half of 2024. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. NBA free agency has begun with intrigue coming out of the LA area. LeBron James and Paul George opted out of their deals, which would have paid them $51.4 million and $48.8 million respectively next season. While LeBron appears to want to stay with the Lakers on a restructured deal, George is reportedly in the hunt for a four-year max contract. The new CBA intends to promote parity by reducing teams' ability to acquire players after they cross certain payroll thresholds, but a steadily rising salary cap will have the max deals of the future steadily approaching nine figures per season. Teams will have all of that in mind as they consider if they want to take the plunge for George, Clay Thompson, James Harden, or any of the other big names out there. They won't be cheap, but their deals will look pretty pedestrian in a few years. Demarcus Russell is being sued by the high school that made him a star. The 2007 number one NFL draft pick was a volunteer coach at his alma mater, Williamson High School in Mobile, Alabama. Now he is no longer welcome on campus, and he's facing a lawsuit that accuses him of depositing a $74,000 check meant for the school in his own bank account. Russell solicited the donation from a local building company owner named Chris Knowles for a weight room equipment for the school, but the school never got the check, and Russell reportedly deposited the check at a credit union and withdrew $55,000 from it. Payment on the check had apparently already been stopped prior to that massive withdrawal, but he was reportedly given the money anyway by mistake. Russell has filed a counterclaim against Knowles regarding the stopping of the check. His three-year NFL career ended after the 2009 season. He earned $36.4 million as a player. Another sign of the growth in soccer in the U.S., the European Championship has been notching record ratings in this country. The group stage of the Euros saw the highest average for that tournament among English-language telecasts in history on Fox and FS1. The 1,045,000 average viewership was 30% higher than the 2021 edition and eked out 2012's 1,200,000 average. Perhaps more interesting than the top line number was what captured the attention of U.S. fans. The match between Portugal and Georgia might not have been at the top of many lists before it started, but Georgia's major upset ended up being a huge draw, averaging 1,461,000 viewers and peaking at over 1.8 million. Now the U.S. national team has to do its part to keep the momentum going by advancing to the elimination round in Copa America. The team has a crucial game against Uruguay today. Joined now by Andrew Brandt, Executive Director of the Morad Center for Sports Law at Villanova University, host of the Business of Sports podcast and author of the Sunday 7 newsletter. Welcome, Andrew. Good to be with you. How are you, Owen? Doing great. Uh, as you are still processing the news that the NFL is um, has been um, told to pay $4.7 billion to Sunday ticket users, as well as $96 million to bar owners in an antitrust case. Uh, what's your initial reaction to the ruling? Big loss, but let's hold the phone on whether things change in NFL broadcast agreements and NFL Sunday ticket and NFL subscribing to out of market games. And I just want to put that caution in because the NFL has been here before. They lose a district court level, but they always seem to win at the circuit court level. And we'll see if it always, it gets all the way to the Supreme Court. Let me take listeners and viewers behind the scenes a little bit. Owen, 1961 Sports Broadcasting Act, that allowed an antitrust exemption for the NFL to negotiate as a group to negotiate collectively with broadcast networks. So there was no Dallas Cowboys. There was no Philadelphia Eagles negotiating their own deals. This was born out of an antitrust exemption in 1961 where the league could do the deals collectively. You get the whole product. So anyone who watches an NFL game during the season, you are never, ever watching a local broadcast. You're watching a national broadcast, and that's the way it's been done for all these 60 something years. The question in this case, a jury trial that just concluded in LA that started in 2015 was, was that antitrust exemption from 1961 applicable to this situation where the NFL sold off out of market games to a network, essentially DirecTV and 
they could do so. As all games, right? Not the Cowboys games, not the Packers games, not the Eagles games. And the NFL argued that's part of our antitrust exemption. The jury said today, no, it's not. It's an antitrust violation for you to sell off this product beyond the network deals. So at the end of the day, this is a ruling that the antitrust exemption the NFL has had since 1961 does not extend beyond broadcast games on Fox, CBS, and that there was, this sounds too harsh a word, but a conspiracy between the NFL, Fox, CBS, and others to get a high market price for those games so that people wouldn't be encouraged to do that rather than just watch the free market games on Fox and the ESPN. I hope that gives some background as to where we are right now. Does that, does that line that the jury's drawing make sense to you? Because I could see just throwing out the antitrust exemption and just saying that's, that exemption itself is breaking the law. The line around Sunday ticket, maybe it makes sense, but just on, on the face of it, it seems a little arbitrary to me. Yes and no. I mean, I think as speaking as a lawyer, I could see where, yeah, that antitrust exemption could apply all the way through. And let me say this, the judge in this case has been very pro NFL. He didn't make the decision. The jury did. And then the NFL always has a problem with a jury because they see the NFL as big, bad corporate making billions of dollars, leaving us in the dust. So the judge could still get involved here and say, I'm going to set aside that jury verdict. Now, speaking as a fan, it always occurred to me as a Packer fan living out of market after my, my decade working there, why couldn't I just buy Packer games? And I couldn't, right? So when people go to other sports, and we know all the problems going on with Diamond Sports and RSNs, but they just buy their games, right? They just buy their local games in the NBA or the NHL or in Major League Baseball, but you can't do that in the NFL. You can't go buy Packer games living in Colorado. You can't go buy Dolphins games living in San Francisco. You have to buy the whole thing. So again, taking my purely legal hat off, that doesn't seem right. And that's what the jury found. So the jury really agreed with the premise I just said. Why can't they buy individual games? Why do they have to price it out? So I'm guessing that the NFL still has and will feel strongly about their legal position that if they want to charge a heavy price for out-of-market games as a package, it's the same premise as charging CBS, Fox, ESPN billions of dollars as a package. And it goes back to the same legal argument of the 1961 antitrust exemption. Yeah. And that, um, yeah, just the regular business of media rights where you just get the highest price you can. I think that's sort of what I'm used to or where my brain is calibrated of, well, don't, yeah, don't you just see what the market gets here? But of course, this isn't the market. This is a very constrained market, you know, based around what the NFL is willing to sell and what it won't, what it will allow and what it won't. The other part of this, Owen, again, we're just breaking it down in real time. I think that there were a couple smoking gun memos. There wasn't a lot of coverage of this trial, but there were a couple of smoking gun memos that came out that I think had a big influence on the jury. One was the NFL talking to Fox and ESPN about what to charge. And I don't know the specifics, but something like we've got to charge a lot. We have to make this a truly premium product. So they just can't buy this and ignore watching Fox and CBS. And we need the ratings for our advertising rates, et cetera, et cetera. The more damaging memo than that even was supposedly between the NFL and ESPN that wanted to offer a package for individual team games at some $89 or something like that price a year. And the NFL said, no, we're not doing that. So that, if I'm a juror, and hearing that, it obviously would have some influence, and it did. Does this, assuming this judgment goes through, and obviously there's a lot of hoops to to jump through before that, you know, is a done deal through all the appeals. Um, what kind of precedent would this set going forward? What would be allowed that isn't allowed today if if this ruling goes all the way through? Yeah, I just talked about how it's so different in the other major sports. And again, I reiterate, as you've talked about on this podcast a lot with your reporters, 
the RSN model, the local sports model is going through a lot of changes and a lot of difficulties, but that's been the model that the NFL has not resorted to in allowing individual packages. Now, the motto of the NFL for my 10 years there has always been all for one, one for all, meaning that we're 100% shared revenue on broadcast. So Jerry Jones could go sell the Cowboys for a lot more in terms of their games than pick a market, the Buffalo Bills market or the Green Bay Packers market, even though they're popular teams. But it's always been, hey, the weakest link, we got to all stick together. It's the membership. If this ruling stays, and again, there are going to be a lot of appeals, then you have to look at, well, is there a different way of doing business? And is this going to really hurt? Like no NFL team is ever going to go under. No NFL team is going to have a problem making payroll. But the Cincinnati Bengals local market games or the Cincinnati market Bengals package is going to be a fraction of the Dallas Cowboys package. If we start going down that path, then we're going to look a lot more like baseball. Then we're going to look like the shared revenue of the NFL. That's kind of the ultimate change that could happen after a ruling like this. All right, let me give your listeners a sense of where we are. We have the verdict. It's $4 billion. A small part of it is going to the commercial establishments, bars and restaurants, the rest to the consumer side. It will be trebled according to antitrust damages to $12 billion. As far as the payout, that's all according to class action lawsuits. The lawyers take their cut, and then it's determined by some formula that's way above my pay grade, how many years you had DirecTV, what did you do, how much you pay, what were you involved in. That's all going to happen. But again, no one's going to be seeing a check anytime soon, and the NFL is not changing its broadcast agreements anytime soon because there are three methods of appeal. One, go back to the judge that I mentioned was pro NFL during the deliberations and see if he might set aside either the verdict or the award as excessive. If that doesn't work, or maybe even if it does, the NFL will appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which again will take months, if not years. And if they lose that, all the way to the Supreme Court. So, oh, and I would think if if this case started in 2015, we may be entering the second decade of this case before it's resolved. If, let's say, the NFL has to pay something in the neighborhood of $5 billion when this is all said and done, whenever that is, how damaging is that to the league? I mean, this is the, the one league that could maybe take a $5 billion hit and, you know, barely feel it. But how how will it feel it? Yeah, it's going to take that hit and damages are obviously paid out over a long period of time. Nothing will happen right away. I mean, the league paid out $790 million to the city of St. Louis. The league paid out close to a billion to concussion plaintiffs. This would obviously be more than that if we're talking about those kind of numbers, but <laughs> they'll survive. I'm getting questions right away on Twitter and I've gotten them from players through my DM. Uh, will this affect the salary cap? The way I understand it, the answer is no. Salary cap is based on revenues, and revenues are primarily media tickets and all other kinds of revenues, club seat revenues, etc. Uh, gambling revenues. Now, the league is not based. The salary cap is not based on expenses paid out for things like legal damages. So, the way I interpret the salary cap, this will have zero effect on the salary cap. Salary cap is based on revenues, not on what came up in litigation for the NFL. So I think the players are safe with that for the ones that have been asking me. Um, the real question I'm getting from people, as you are, as we all will be, is does, will this change the way we view games? And again, it's got to go through appeals. We've got YouTube TV now. We've got a lot of things that would have to change over the years. So will you be able to buy out-of-market games for one team, for your favorite team? I think we're a long way off from that. And anything else you're kind of watching for as this whole thing unfolds at a rather glacial pace? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember being around the NFL when they'd have negative verdicts come in. Again, back in my day, we had a hugely negative verdict where Maurice Claret won at the lower court level and there were no restrictions on draft choice. Uh, what year you could come out in the draft because he brought a case as a freshman. We were going crazy. We have to scout freshmen. We have to scout high school players with drafts coming up. But the NFL told us, as they're telling every team right now, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We got it on appeal. 
We're confident in our legal arguments. We're going to win this. They did back with Claret, and we'll see. The last thing I'll say is I mentioned the LA jury, the, uh, I'm sorry, the St. Louis jury trial. NFL had bad facts. I mean, they played fast and loose with their own relocation guidelines to take the team out of St. Louis and give them to Los Angeles. They knew they had bad facts. They settled that case for about $800 million. I, I'm going to trust the NFL lawyers that if they knew they really had bad facts, they would have settled. Part of me is like, why didn't they settle this case? But they seem confident in appeals court judges or even this judge that they will get through this. So we're trusting, you know, my saying there will be lawyers and the NFL is trusting theirs. There are many lawyers. Right. I mean, the statement they came out with afterwards, it seemed like kind of what everyone says when they have a bad judgment against them, which is, you know, we are all peel. This is baseless, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, especially if they don't want to set a certain precedent that uh, this wasn't settled. I mean, it takes two to tango. Um, and maybe the other side felt like we have good facts and we're going to win this. And they did. Um, but yeah, I, I wonder, you know, even if down the line, like with the Ninth Circuit, even with the Supreme Court, if, you know, there's still room for a settlement here. There always is. And there's always a possibility it could happen. I just think we're a long way from that because the NFL seems so confident. And again, this judge has been a friend of them, even though it's a jury trial. So we'll see what happens. We may have a reversal of this verdict within a week, but we'll see. I think it's obviously good news for these plaintiffs, uh, but they got a long way to go. All right. Andrew Brandt, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure, Owen. That's it for today. Let me know what kind of topics and guests you would like to hear from on the show. You can find me on X at Owen Poindexter, and our show account is FOS underscore today. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.